Okay, welcome everybody. Thank you for coming. Today we're going to talk about tropical fruit IPM, not tropical fruit 1 p.m., which was some people I think read it the wrong way. So it's at two, tropical fruit Tuesdays at two. Uh, so IPM is integrated pest management. We're going to talk about all the different uh, things that go with that. I'm Jeff Wasileski. I'm the commercial tropical fruit extension agent. Now I work for University of Florida IFAS in Miami-Dade County. University of Florida has an extension office in all 67 counties. And University of Florida extension agents give out information that is fact-based, that is from a lot of our research centers. And we do have a research center um, down in Homestead called the Tropical Research Education Center. And I'm lucky to work with a tropical root specialist there, a tropical fruit entomologist, a pathologist, and a tropical fruit plant breeder. So, very lucky guy. So this is Tropical Fruit Tuesdays, and we're going to talk about integrated pest management today. In July, we're going to talk about the mango. On August 17th, we're going to talk about tropical fruit aftercare which is what do you do after you pick your fruit and what do you do after you plant your tree, all the aftercare. And um, we'll talk about that. And then September 14th, we're gonna do propagation by cuttings. Now, um, if you do have questions, you're gonna be on mute so you can ask those questions in the chat. I see a few related questions in the chat. So we're gonna answer those uh, as we go, not quite yet. Okay, I always like to start out with where to get good information. Obviously, you're getting some somewhat good information today from me, but a really great place to get information is this new platform that University of Florida has opened up. It used to be EDIS, a database, and now it's Ask IFAS. So you can just uh, search Ask IFAS. You'll find this screen. Then it says, what can we help you with? You type in there, let's say you put in the word uh, sapodilla, it would come up with a bunch of different um, publications on sapodilla. One of them would have about 12 pages and it would have a chart, like when to fertilize, when to prune, it would tell you how to plant, how to, how to prune, uh, what pests to look out for. So a lot of good information there. That information is peer reviewed so I can't just write something and then put it up there. It has to go through stages. So I do have some EDIS documents on propagation and pruning, but I couldn't just write that and, and get it there. It has to go through a lot of peer review. So if University of Florida doesn't have it, you can search your, your word. Let's say uh, you search breadfruit because we don't have a lot of information on that. And you then you type EDU, you can get information from other um, universities, like University of Hawaii has good information on uh, breadfruit. YouTube, a place you can get good or bad information. I like to watch about three or four different videos on the same subject. And you know, it's great because you're actually visually seeing what they're teaching you. All the Tropical Fruit Tuesdays are on YouTube. So if you go to YouTube and search in the YouTube search bar, Tropical Fruit Tuesdays, you'll find them all there. Um, another great place to get information, and I know some master gardeners are listening today, they're always listening and learning, is master gardeners. That's a really good place to get information. I think your number one place to get information is your own garden or your own grove. If you're in the grove, if your feet are in the grove, if your feet are in your garden, you're seeing what's going on and you're seeing it quickly. And that's important for integrated pest management. Okay, so before we get into integrated pest management, what makes a pest? We're managing these pests. Uh, so what, what defines a pest? Well, it can cause economic damage. It has usually a short life, stop, uh, life cycle, so it can breed very quickly. It has high reproductive rates. Um, they'll feed on plants, the ones we're talking about. They adapt quickly to changing environments. They may acquire pesticide resistance, which we'll talk about in a, in a little bit later. Many are secondary, meaning they're not really bad pests. A uh, few of them are key pests, they're really bad. So I also teach a portion of the pesticide training class, the general standards. 
And these four things on the right come from that. When they say, what, a, what does a pest do? It competes. So think about weeds, how they compete with other plants. It can injure. Uh, think about uh, aphids, how they'll injure your plant. They spread disease. So think about mosquitoes or rats. Uh, and then of course they're annoying. You know, your little sister can be a pest, but it's usually the brother that's the pest, by the way. Uh, key pests. So these are some key pests that we have. Um, ambrosia beetles, they spread around the fungus that, that kills avocado trees, that floral wilt, the Asian citrus psyllid. Um, it spreads citrus greening. So this is a slide that I stole from uh, Trevor Smith of FDAX. So here's all the places that things can come into Florida. So you have 16 major airports, <clears throat> 12 maritime ports, and two spaceports. So we have a lot of things coming in and out of Florida. So we also have a very good climate for pests. We have a big diversity of crops. We have vegetables, we have tropical fruit, we have ornamentals, um, a lot of trade going on. So we are a hotspot, especially in Miami. So here's just some of the things that have come in, some really bad things, uh, citrus greening, pink hibiscus mealybug, red palm mite. You can see there's a lot there. Uh, giant African land snail, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, Laurel wilt, of course, came in from the north. It came in through Georgia, actually. That was one that we can't take all the credit for. Uh, Oriental fruit fly, that was a big problem here about four or five years ago. We had a quarantine. So why do integrated pest management? Why not just do what Everybody always asks, I have this problem, what do I spray? So what pesticide can I spray? How do I kill the problem? So the answer is we have the Everglades to, to our west. We have Biscayne Bay to our right. So if we're putting all these pesticides out, they can very easily get into the water supply. Uh, we have sinkholes or solution holes, excuse me. We have pollinators that we need to be careful with. We have our children that eat the fruit and the vegetables that we have. We have pets. So those are the reasons that we want to use integrated pest management. Also, um, it's, it's more economical to do that rather than just to spray, 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 because spraying costs you money. So integrated pest management. We want to keep our pests to tolerable levels. We're never going to wipe them out completely, but we want to keep them at a, a level that doesn't trigger our threshold of where we're going to have to really take care of them. So for commercial growers, that, that threshold level is a lot lower because you can't just sell fruit that has blemishes or um, has pests on it. Uh, in your own garden, you can certainly eat something that has a few black spots of anthracnose, let's say. So the management tactics we're going to talk about are cultural, physical, biological, chemical. So that's just one tool in your belt and regulatory. So these are the five sort of pillars of, of integrated pest management. So we're also gonna really look at pest ID. This is super important. Monitoring goes with that. And then threshold, which I just mentioned, that's sort of the trigger where you have to really do something. <clears throat> so integrated pest management combines several complementary pest control methods in a mutually enhancing way to reduce pest populations to less than damaging numbers. So you have this piece, all these puzzle pieces that go together. You're doing all these things that we looked at here, all these things. We're going to go through each one. And typically, there is no silver bullet. People want the silver bullet. What can I spray? What, what's the one thing I can do that was going to knock out this pest? Remember, pests are going to be there. They're, they multiply by the thousands. They're really difficult to get rid of. 
So the silver bullet just usually does not exist. Okay, the keys to integrated pest management. You have to know your plants. So in order to grow healthy crops, you have to know how to do that. So those um, Ask IFAS documents that I talked about, they really talk about the right way to grow healthy crops. You need to know your pests and what damage they cause. So if you think you have one thing, but you really have another, and you're spraying for that one thing, or you're trying to get rid of that one thing using integrated pest management, it's really the other pest that's causing the trouble. So you have to kind of know your pest. And that's where we can help out a lot, where you can send us pictures and, and we can look at things. Like I said, we do have a tropical fruit entomologist, so he will um, oftentimes help me out if I don't know what something is. Very important that you monitor that you're scouting for pests. You're looking, you're looking, you're looking. That's what I talked about at the beginning. You wanna be in your garden, you wanna be in your grove, you wanna be looking for these pests because if you see them when they first arrive, they're much easier to get rid of than when they've been there for a while. So decision-making is a key. When do, you, when do you intervene? When do you do control? And then record keeping. You wanna keep good records so you know what you did and you know what worked and what didn't work. Okay, step one, know your cropping system, know your trees, know your, what you're growing. So the best way to prevent pest problems is to grow healthy crops. So if you have your, your fruit trees and you, you have them pruned correctly so they get a lot of light, the air can go through them, um, they're fertilized, they're, they have enough water, they're not weak. That is the best way to prevent pest problems because pests really like weak plants, uh, especially diseases like fungus and bacteria, things like that. Um, so if you have a good healthy plant, you're in better shape. Just like us, if we're worn down and we're, we haven't been sleeping well, we haven't been eating well, it's a better chance that we're gonna, we're gonna get sick. So you do that through nutrition, water management, resistant cultivars. Some cultivars don't have as much trouble with pests and diseases as others. And then spacing, that's where we're talking about airflow. Okay, so I'm getting a few questions in the chat. So I'm just gonna back up to the first one and Dr. Green kind of answered that. Uh, Jane Lee asked, um, oh wait, the, the first one is, thank you, I have mealybugs on my Potomba, which I wash off daily. Um, because it's in fruit, any suggestions beyond neem, dawn, et cetera. So the answer to that is all those things we're gonna be talking about today. I like that you're washing, washing them off instead of spraying them. Um, and I'm gonna show you a database where you can look at all the, all the pesticides that are labeled for your crops. Um, then the answer, the questions, the other ones that were related Jane Lee also asked, my Nona fruit is mummifies, it has a boring bug, I'm told, any way to save the fruit? Um, and then Giselle has, says, I have the same issue with my soursop. Muriel has the same issue. So Steve Green, Dr. Green, who always helps out, he asked, mummified and Nona's, all kinds, are from the seed borer, then fungal attack through the openings. So We'll, we're going to talk about physical control that you can do to your plants. So one thing you can do with the seed borer is you can bag the fruit when they're very small. That way the seed borer doesn't get in there. Uh, another thing you can do is just keep everything very clean. So those old fruit that are mummified, get rid of those. Don't leave those out there. And Angela Kim asks, to avoid thrips, building resistance to insecticide, rotate brands, uh, how she rotates brands of, of pesticides, how long before I switch back, years or six months. So we're gonna talk about building resistance and, and that, Angela, so we'll get to that. Uh, so you gotta know your pests. We have many different pests. There we have in the top right, uh, dragon fruit, and that's caused by thrips. That actually is caused when the, the flowers are there, the, the thrips attack the very, the flowers and the small fruit, and the, as they grow, they have this scaliness. 
Uh, papaya fruit fly is a big problem. The Caribbean fruit fly is a big problem with guava. So leaf footed bug, it puts these little pricks into like passion fruit and dragon fruit. So you have these little holes. Uh, you have caterpillars that eat on things. Lychee arnos mite, which is a new, very bad pest. Uh, the tea shot hole borer is uh, another insect that attacks avocados that we thought was going to be pretty bad. It's not as bad as we, we thought it was. So that's some good news. So know your pest. So you have snails. You have snails in your garden and you think, uh, I need to put out some snail bait or I need to pick all these snails and squash them. So these particular snails that you might have seen, these just eat lichen off your plants. They're not going to hurt your plants at all. So you have to kind of know what you're looking at. You just can't see a snail and decide that you're going to, you know, put out snail bait or, or kill them all because some snails are good. So here is a giant African land snail. And we can tell that because it has this little hook here, right here. See this little, this little hinge? That's the giant African land snail, which they've just about wiped out. But here is the land, giant African land snail to the right. And to the left, we have just a normal snail that's not going to do a tree snail. And uh, one thing that you can tell the giant African land snails is all their lines are longitudinal except for these, these, this is part of the, the shell. But you see all the lines go from tip to tip. Here we have a line going sideways, so that tells you it's not a giant African land snail. So there's ways that you can figure out what you have. So know your pest. So on the left, we have a mango that has sooty mold. So we know that sooty mold is caused by pests that feed and, and like aphids and scale that feed on the plant and then they drip this honeydew and then the, the fungus, the, the sooty mold grows in the honeydew. So, and mealybugs can do the same thing. So we go over, we flip over the leaf and we see these little white things and we're like, okay, we're definitely gonna spray. We're gonna kill that, uh, that's a problem. But these little white things are actually juvenile ladybugs and they're eating the scale, excuse me, they're eating the scale that's there. You might not be able to see it, but there's one there, 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 one there, one there, one there, they're all over. But these little guys are gonna eat them up. So we don't really need to spray if we're um, not in the commercial setting. In the commercial setting, you might be worried about the the sooty mold getting onto your fruit, but in your home landscape, you really don't need to worry because these little guys are gonna do the job and they're gonna show up. If you're not spraying a lot and you have a variety of things in your yard or in your grove, then the natural predators will show up. Okay, I just wanted to point out this website is on the um, University of Florida Trek website. It's called Avocado IPM, and it has a lot of good information there uh, for specifically for avocados. It has all the pests, it has what to do, the pest feeding habits. You can search by part of the plant damage, so you can say the leaves, and then it will show you all the things that attack the leaves. So this is something to, to check out for avocados. Okay, step three, monitor. We're gonna look, we're gonna look, we're gonna look. We're always gonna be looking for these problems, pest problems. So it's always advised, but it's not always practice. I try every day at work to walk the grove here, to walk the grove, walk some of the property and look for issues, look for problems. Uh, right now, I'm also looking for ripe mangoes so I can pick those and share them with everybody, but I'm also looking for problems. So thorough monitoring leads to good management decisions. You've got to see this stuff to, to know it's there. It avoids nasty surprises. You can find new pests. Uh, so you want to be on the lookout for those and you can avoid crop losses. So we're going to monitor. One thing you might want to get is a little hand lens that will help you look for some of these small things like um, mites are very difficult to see but you can see them with a, a 
magnifying lens. So here's something that I saw in the grove when I was walking. We have a white sapote, which is related to citrus. So this is a, a caterpillar that really likes to get on citrus uh, called, I think it's called orange dog. It looks kind of like a bird poop. So it's kind of camouflaged a little, but I saw it when it was starting to do damage. So I had a couple options. One was I could just hand pick them off. Another was I could spray Dipel to, to kill them. Um, another one is I could just kind of wait and, and see because the, the white sapote plant was in pretty good shape. I wasn't, it didn't have any fruit on it. I wasn't really worried about it. So I did wait, they kind of went away. Um, so, but I could have very easily picked them off at this stage before they did too much damage. So scouting in that case really alerted me to this problem. As soon as it was there, I saw it. Okay, so decision-making, we talked about thresholds. So economic threshold is the insect's population level or extent of crop damage at which the value of the crop destroyed exceeds the cost of controlling the pest. So we're looking at the money there. This is commercially. Uh, if we put in this much to control the pest, are we gonna not have enough that we're gonna make money on this crop? For key pests, and as aggressive disease vectors, the economic threshold is close to zero. So you have to really get them or they're gonna wipe out your crop. We can see this right now with the lychee aranos mite. If it gets on your crop, uh, you're basically under quarantine. You can't sell that crop within, within Florida. So um, that's something that you really wanna be monitoring for. And for some pests, relatively low populations can be tolerated specifically if natural enemies are present. So step five, this is intervention. This, these are the, the tools that I'm going to, to talk about. So we have cultural, mechanical and physical, biological, regulatory, and chemical. So when we're talking about the Anona seed borer, you could use chemical to knock that pest away. You could also use mechanical and physical where you bag the fruit and you can use cultural where you are actually taking the mummified fruit and getting rid of that. So that's um, all the things that we would use there for IPM for that particular pest that was mentioned in the chat. Okay, so I can't read what that says on my screen. Cultural control. Okay, make the crop environment less suitable for insect pests. So we're looking at resistant cultivars. We don't want dense plantings overcrowded with overlapping branches. So we have these fruit groves that were planted and they weren't really pruned as they got bigger. So now they're all touching. There's not a lot of airflow. Uh, there's a lot of shade, so that's not good. So. Um, you can avoid that overcrowding with some pruning or more spacing. Um, I think one of our master gardeners has just put a link to that pest that I, that I showed you, which is a giant swallowtail butterfly. So isn't that good that I didn't kill all of those? I think it is. Um, but if I was a commercial grower, that would be something that I would need to worry about. Um, you wanna avoid dense plantings, like I said, weed management, so you want to be careful what you're growing under your trees because some thrips and things like the, the particular weeds that you're growing and they'll jump to your, your fruit um, or your, to your trees. The time of harvest, sometimes you can beat a pest by picking a little early. Some people sell their mangoes green or they sell them as baby mangoes. So they're skipping all the anthracnose, they're skipping problems with squirrels and things like that by, by picking early. Uh, one thing I do in my own yard is I try to really pick my mangoes when they're just about ready before they, they get ready, ripe on the tree because I do have some very um, industrious squirrels that I need to beat to the punch. Uh, and then proper irrigation and nutrition. That's something that will help you. Remember I said healthy trees 
will really allow you to have less pest problems. Okay, mechanical and physical control. We have traps, we have barriers, sticky traps. Bottom right, you see they put up a screen so birds won't get in there. Uh, top right, you have these little spikes so the birds don't sit up there and, and poop on the patrons. I think this is in the falls where, you know, people walk underneath here so you don't want the birds sitting up there. Uh, this trap on the left is catching ambrosia beetles. Uh, so is that sticky trap down in the middle. And you see there's a lure up above to draw them in. So fruit bagging is a way, if you've ever driven past uh, a grove in Homestead and you see all these little white bags all over the trees, those are guava plants. And they're bagging the fruit because of the fruit fly is so bad that if they don't bag each one, they're going to have an issue. Uh, sticky bands, this you can put around the tree. So things like ants can't go up the tree because ants will actually farm other pests and move them from one place to another. So this stops the ants. Uh, also, you can physically remove the pest. Uh, sanitation is important. So you're removing infested limbs or fruit. So if you see that you have this one branch that really has a lot of pest problems and you just caught it at that moment, you can chop that off and double bag it and get it out of there. Um, so an example with Laurel Wilt is they chip the infested wood of the avocados because that gets rid of the, the ambrosia beetles. Unfortunately, the tree is already uh, dead. So also, uh, they have these green balls you see on the left that catches um, um, in a pest that gets into papayas. There's the green ball bottom left. So it's sticky. So it looks like a papaya. They go to it and it catches them. So biological control. This is where you're using living things to control the pests. So on the right, you have an air potato vine. And that little red thing there is an air potato beetle that was released, I believe, by University of Florida to kill these air potatoes. So you see all the holes in here. This little beetle is doing its work. Uh, I mentioned Dipel. This is, is something that you can spray on, on caterpillars. And, and um, it, it's, it's a living thing. And it, it's, has, it will not, it's not anything that's going to be toxic. So you can put it on there and not worry about it. And it works specifically on caterpillars. So let's say the caterpillar, the hornworms are eating your um, tomatoes. That's something that you can use where it's, it's a contact. So it's only going to kill what you spray with it or only caterpillars that you spray with it. And then uh, we have the classic um, biological control here, the ladybug eating all the aphids. And this ladybug is probably going to lay her eggs. So her young, those little white mop things that I showed you, will really get in here and do some damage. So controlling pests using natural enemies, predators, parasitoids, and pathogens. That's biological control. Here you have a lot of different biological control methods. Uh, Lacewing is a good one. You have all these different ones here. Um, some of these slides that here are, are moving around, those are from Daniel Carrillo. Those are out of my league. So also parasitoids, these are things that will lay eggs into uh, the pests. Uh, entomopathic. Things you have fungi, bacteria, viruses, and nematodes. These are things that are living that you spray on the pests and they actually kill the pests. So Bacillus thuringiensis, this one in the middle, that is what I kept calling the, the brand name, which is Dipel. That's what it actually is. Um, Bavaria bassiana, this is one that we're using for the ambrosia beetles and laurel wilt. Uh, and then you have nematodes that actually get into the, um, the pests. So here's one that's not used that often and we can't really 
um, count on it, but it's, it's something that with really bad pests, then there's regulatory control. So you see the left, the giant African land snails, FDAX has done a very good job. They have just a few corridors left of this and they're going to wipe it out. They've really been working on it for years and years. Uh, it's a very bad pest. Uh, Oriental fruit fly on the right, that was the quarantine zone that you see there in green. So anybody that was in there, they had to do certain things so they would be able to sell their fruit outside of that zone. And that was the pest that was really bad that came into the Redland to, to, to Homestead, and we were able to wipe it out. Now the one in the middle, that's the Lychiaranos mite. They're currently trying to eradicate that. It is in 13 counties, and um, I don't know that they'll be able to eradicate it because Laura and I, Laura works here as an extension agent with homeowners, and we get calls about this every day. Laura Vasquez. Okay, so chemical control. I'm going to spend a good amount of time talking about this because everybody wants to use this. We just talked about a whole bunch of other things that you can do, but sometimes chemical control is needed. I personally, in my own yard, I never use it, but obviously my commercial growers, this is something that is a tool in their belt that they need to use. So we have different types of insecticides. Insecticides are things that kill insects. So we have broad spectrum. That means it kills a wide variety of things by attacking a, a system like a nervous system. So that would kill like everything, the bees, everything. Narrow spectrum, more selective, less harmful on natural enemies. So we're targeting the pest. A contact insecticide has to hit the pest to work. But systemic is absorbed by the plant, gets into the leaves and the twigs, and that protects the plant from the pests. This is less harmful on natural enemies, but we are going to eat those fruit and, and vegetables and things like that. So systemic is something that we really need to read the label and see if it's approved. And Laura has put in the chat a good point. We have a workshop coming soon for homeowners on the light chiernos mite. And Laura, if you could look up the date of that, that would be great. I could look it on my phone here, but I think that would be in poor taste. So with, with pesticides, um, label is the law. Whatever it says on that label, you have to do that. You cannot vary from that. If it says you need to wear a full body suit and a respirator, you can't just put on long sleeve and long pants uh, and some goggles. You have to follow the label. It's your responsibility to read that label. You don't want to go to jail. You don't want to get huge fines. You don't want to get yourself sick. So protect yourself and your employees. This is very important to you and me. So these are some of the ways you can protect yourself. This person is totally protected. This is, I used to have to spray pesticides way back when and um, I wouldn't even read the label to see what I needed to suit up. I would just do like this. I would do the full suit no matter what, because I was just worried that even if it said you, you only needed um, to wear long sleeves and long pants, um, then I definitely would, I would just suit up all the way. I would be very careful. So your lychee tree in the Aranos mite will be June 17th at 1.30. And Dr. Green says, in addition to the safety issues to people and pets of most chemical agents, um, most are very unselective and will kill off honeybees and other beneficial insects. True. Dr. Green is an organic grower, so he knows what he's talking about. Okay, so Angela Kim asked about pesticide resistance. This is a real problem. So if you spray the same thing over and over and over, what you're doing is creating a superbug. So let's say, for instance, we had 100 um, aphids on a plant, and 10 of them like to hide under, under the plant. So we spray, we kill 90, but the 10 that like to hide underneath the plant, they're protected. So those 10 have babies. So now 50 of the 100 have the, the 
they want, they have the genetic want to, to, to hide. So they're hiding the 50, the 50 are on top, there's 50 underneath. Then you spray again. So you kill the 50 on top, the 50 underneath survive. Then they have babies, so on and so on and so on. That's sort of a very simple way to show you how resistance works, but that's kind of what happens. So you keep spraying the same thing and they get used to it either by the way they hide or the way they actually take in the pesticide and some of them don't die. And then those are the ones that have the babies. So they pass that along. And remember they're having babies really, really quick. So they can do that very quickly. So how do we avoid this? Use the recommended rate. Don't use less, don't use more. People like to use a lot more because they say, okay, if I put an ounce per gallon, and that's what it says, I'm gonna put two ounces per gallon and I'm gonna really make it work. You only need the one ounce. The pesticide company is not gonna tell you less than you need. So rotate pesticides. Angela Kim was talking about, she uses different things. She was talking about two separate pesticides. I think using only two different ones, you're gonna end up with resistance even with two, even if you space them out. So I would use maybe four different things. And then also we're using different modes of action. So some were spraying on the leaves, some is a powder that is being systemic, things like that. But remember, integrated pest management, all those other things I told you about, those are the things that are really gonna help. So you don't have to use um, pesticides, which is our third point here, use other control methods Follow the label, do what the label says, apply correctly and thoroughly. I just noticed I'm getting towards the end of my time. So I'll go quick. So on the label, you have danger, warning, caution. Danger means a teaspoon or less can kill you. Caution, one ounce or more. So even though it just says caution, that doesn't mean that it's not going to be bad. So we have restricted use pesticides. These are things that you need a license to apply. So we do teach those classes here. You have to pass two tests to get your license. Uh, labeling, you wanna look for the brand name, the common name, the chemical name. So brand name would be the big flashy one. A common name is this paraquat. And then the chemical name is this funky one here that looks real hard to say that I'm not even gonna try to say. So there's the label. There's the three things we talked about. So the brand, the common name, and the chemical name, just so you know what that looks like on a label. Um, I want to talk about cdms.net. If you search that and then you click on advanced search, this will tell you everything that's labeled for your particular crop. So you go here, you type in the crop, the state, and the, the product. So we're going to put Insecticide, Sapodilla, Florida, hit next. If you want organic products only, you hit that little button there. So it comes up with Sapodilla. So we hit next. Then it's gonna have, it has 101 products that are labeled as insecticides for Sapodillas in Florida. So you can click on these and read the labels to see if this is something you're interested in. If it's restricted use, you have to have a license to apply it. So we click here, we click on the label, specimen label right here. And then you come up with a label, you can read the whole label. I really um, recommend before you do anything, you read the label with a fine tooth comb to see if this is something you really wanted to do and that it's gonna work. And if, if you're, this will tell you that Sapodilla is labeled on here because we're looking at it through the database. But if you just go and buy something and it says you can spray it on avocado and mango, but it doesn't mention Sapodilla, it's illegal to put on Sapodilla. So you don't want to do that. And this website was CDMS right here, cdms.net. You can search CDMS label and you should be able to find it, then go to advanced search. It is free. Okay, remember label is the law. It's your responsibility to know the law. You don't wanna to go to jail. You don't want huge fines, protect yourself and your staff. So to sum it up, 
IPM, Integrated Pest Management, at 2 p.m. today, uh, is you're getting your pests to tolerable levels. You have a combination of tactics. We've talked about cultural, physical, biological, chemical, regulatory. That's where the state or the government steps in, like we saw with um, Oriental Fruit Fly and the giant African land snail. And then you want to ID that pest, you want to monitor, and you want to know your thresholds. When do you act? OK, we are just perfect on time, 2.45. So I wanna thank you guys so much for your time. I hope this was beneficial to you. This will be, this is being recorded. So I will put this on YouTube uh, probably by tomorrow. I think I'll have the time to do it. So thank you guys so much for coming. And uh, I will see you hopefully for the mango next month. Thank you guys so much.